Over to you, Irene. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, Professor Jane Wang from Cornell. And as many of the protagonists of this uh, series of seminar, uh, she had a very transdisciplinary career path from theoretical condensed matter physics to the physics of living organisms. So it, it, it's really an honor for me to introduce, to introduce you, Jane, and uh, let's hear about your story. Well yeah, thanks a lot, Irene, and uh, thanks, Shri, and, uh, um, for organizing this, and also Orit, who invited me uh, early on, I think, when the program started. So I'm happy to be part of this um, group and uh, uh, tell you a little bit about why I study insects. Right? And um, so anyhow, here's a short answer, which is I found them interesting and beautiful. And uh, uh, as we study them, and we often find surprising and profound uh, results. And ultimately, I think our work expands our worldview. And that is the trajectory that I think uh, almost all of us uh, uh, would uh, find as we uh, start from school. So uh, let me start uh, with uh, how I began. I grew up in Shanghai. And uh, I remember um, when I was a kid, of course, uh, like all, all kids, we have lots of questions. And I think somehow we're fundamentally wired to just have these questions bubbling up. And uh, um, it, it's, when you start, you ask your parents, you ask people around. And some of the questions I jot down, which uh, are kind of a question we ask when we do research. Uh, in fact, we already start asking when we were a little kid. So in that sense, we haven't changed. Uh, the way we change is how we uh, address these questions and how we go from uh, our question to answers. Uh, so I think my own trajectory uh, reflects uh, some of that. And that is, uh, how do we go about our own curiosity? And so I said, I grew up in Shanghai. I grew up in the, uh, in the city. And so I only had to walk a block or two to my first school, which is a lab school. And the terrific teachers and my impression what back then was, well, everything was so clear because teachers really made math and uh, Chinese and uh, other uh, 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 the whole curriculum uh, uh, enjoyable. And by the time I went to middle school, middle school, and that's when I was first introduced to uh, uh, physics. Well, there is something different happened. And um, well, mathematics was uh, uh, lots of puzzles. You solve them, and uh, that was engaging. Uh, physics was engaging in a different way. And that is, there was also a bit of a mystery behind it. Even though after you solve the problem, you always, there's this lingering background that you want to know what's going on, why is it so, why is it not in show frame uh, works like so and so on. And one of the uh, remarkable book I read was by George Gamow and it was translated into Chinese. It's called Adventures in Physics. And uh, that was an account of the 20th uh, century discovery of quantum mechanics all the way to special relativity. And I just felt, wow, there's another world out there. And uh, in his book, there was also pictures of quantum tunneling and so on. And it was the first time I heard the notion, there's a space and time. I literally stopped and I think, well, I haven't thought about the world in such a way. So that was extremely fascinating. And, uh, and anyhow, by the time I went to high school, I had to go to uh, out a little bit on the edge of the city where uh, uh, there are uh, boarding schools uh, for, uh, for us to focus on uh, various subjects. And, uh, and, and the most school already by then, uh, even though the curriculum is full, but uh, uh, mathematics and the physics and the chemistry were the focus because that was the ethos of the environment then. Uh, I grew up at a time, the city has evolved a lot and the country has evolved a lot. And there was a tremendous uh, sort of a, a, a sort of an interest in developing science programs. And, uh, I'm not sure how I, so there's a picture on the right, uh, uh, which shows uh, the campus uh, where I eventually went to university at the Fudan University, uh, which is um, uh, 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 the focus on physics. And uh, there is a picture 
daughter of uh, uh, the president and uh, uh, Xie Xide, who's who's also a physicist. And back then, the presidents or mathematicians and the physicists. And one day we got a note, and uh, the note was, "Well, the president Xie is going to give a lecture to everybody, and what that lecture might be." Uh, uh, it was on the uh, uh, fractional discovery of fractional quantum Hall effect. And so the, it, everybody went just to listen to her lecture. And that was marvelous. And she gave extremely clear lecture and we were all excited. So, so this just gives us a little bit of a background that somehow the country is trying to build a physics pr uh, science program and in particular uh, in physics, um, there was an interest in building up uh, the condensed matter uh, program. And uh, my thesis was on uh, Sue Schrieffer and the Heger model uh, with Professor Sun Xing. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of idea what it was like then. And then uh, I did my PhD work with uh, Leo Kamloff and that was extremely exciting. Um, first of all, it was uh, probably uh, the most intellectual uh, uh, atmosphere uh, that one can experience. We have uh, lots of seminars uh, and they, Leo was trying to build a community among uh, physics, applied mathematics and uh, computational science. And he also has an interest in humanity and social science. So uh, so we be, as a student, we'd be exposed to many talks on uh, a broad uh, range of topics. And so that was super exciting. And the courses were intense and uh, and the science culture there, uh, you walk into the uh, physics building, you see these pictures of James Frank and Fermi. And then there's also Maria Gopemeyer. We would say, who's Maria Gopemeyer? And so that's how we learn about a little bit of science history. Um, and the city is great, lots of theater, art, architecture. So, so it was, a, it was an, a, an extremely uh, fun time. And what I learned from that is, well, it really doesn't matter. Uh, uh, the subject isn't so narrow, as long as you do interesting work, a good work, and in particular, new work are being evaluated, uh, are being valued. So, uh, so that was uh, that. Uh, uh, that was Chicago. And my own work with Leo was a uh, shell model of turbulence. And I was also uh, sent to Paris to work on uh, Paris. He, uh, there was a helium experiment that to be trying to understand uh, the transitions and so on. And so, uh, so that and towards the end, and that uh, I mean, it didn't occur to me um, after all the thesis work. I also have to write a thesis. I asked Leo, "What should I write about?" Leo said, oh, "Whatever you like." So, um, so I thought, well, I already um, published the other ones. And so why don't I learn something else? And so I spent a semester trying to figure out, uh, 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 maybe there is a connection, uh, trying to study the scaling property of passive scalar. And I had to learn a little bit of a conformal field theory. Somehow there was a literature led me to that. And that fun exercise uh, influenced my uh, choice for uh, next postdoc. So for my postdoc, I split between Oxford and the Quran. So I first went to Oxford, in part influenced by this last bit of exercise, which I'll explain. And I should also say, given all the excitement I was telling you about, and the work really starts after dinner. So I went to Oxford and uh, uh, I worked with John Chalker and was an uh, independent postdoc. So I talked to a few people and the reason I was interesting going there is precisely because trying to see if there's some connection between um, what people have worked on in uh, a quantum uh, Hall effect. Uh, there's some techniques being developed, understanding uh, their transport property uh, to the transport property of passive scalars, which is a classical phenomena. And I had no idea if it might work. Um, but fortunately, uh, when I was uh, uh, talking to John, there's something warm between these two uh, uh, connections. And, uh, and then eventually, uh, the problem we formulate was to trying to find, uh, to trying to solve the Green's function for the Fokker Planck uh, operator. And in order to solve that, you have to figure out the spectrum, meaning the distribution of the eigenvalues. And it's different from the quantum system in the sense it's complex because it's not Hermitian. And so one has to find the boundary uh, boundary of these complex eigenvalues. And uh, so I had to learn 
uh, quite a bit from Joao on how to do these, uh, solve these problems uh, using diagrammatic approach. Um, and the Oxford is beautiful and there are lots of things to do on the weekends. And so there I actually worked during the day. Um, Jane, this is your three minute warning. Three or minutes. Two minutes actually, sorry. Oh, three minutes. Okay, so I have to rush. And so, and, and from Oxford and I was in the library one day and I saw this book uh, uh, by Steve Childress on uh, mechanics and flying and swimming. And that's the next point I was going to go to, which is a current. And so I went to current. I talked to Steve and uh, Steve said, yes, it's actually very, uh, the people I asked if he's still interested in that. And he said, well, yes, it's a, a insect flight is very confusing. So that actually finally gets to insect flight. So I will go through this quite quickly, meaning that at the beginning, it was a tremendously uh, 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 confusing. In other words, which puzzle we should solve and how do we solve, go about this? And uh, um, so um, there was lots of uh, uh, puzzles in terms of resolving the flow around a flapping wing. And um, in the interest of time, I don't get into this, but mathematically uh, uh, engaging and uh, requires to think about uh, uh, ways of uh, resolving uh, various puzzles. Um, and then I came to Cornell, and then that's where I have been since 1999, and so uh, quite a bit of time. And uh, uh, we, well, the nature is beautiful, so um, we uh, actually uh, start thinking about free falling problem uh, just by looking at the leaves, how leaves fall, and eventually transition them into the lab where you drop a piece of uh, plates and you find actually these beautiful flat flapping like uh, a trajectory will immediately emerge if you uh, if you just drop them uh, in different orientation. And so that has a connection to insect flight. And we spent quite a bit of a time using that system uh, to extract uh, force models. And we also worked on stability of flight. The idea is without control, they're unstable. And so insects have to uh, evolve to uh, these various neural circuitries to control them. And so through combining the computation and uh, 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 experiments, one can actually now start to make some sense about what the physical principle uh, involved in controlling the stability to perhaps even the uh, an explanation about certain specific neural circuitries in their, uh, in their control circuit. Uh, finally, uh, last uh, uh, last bit is uh, 3D maneuvering flight, and uh, this started when I was a sab at sabbatical at Genelia, and where uh, they actually have lot had lots of dragonflies there, and has a dragonfly arena, and I start working there with my student together with Le uh, Leano, Leonardo, and uh, uh, looking at how a dragonfly fall uh, right itself. And this writing reflects um, is another uh, sort of a quintessential uh, features about organism. They evolve, must evolve uh, control strategies in uh, air. And I believe such a manu maneuvering strategy is fundamental to understanding 3D, uh, all 3D uh, maneuvering flight. So to summarize and uh, and I think our journey of uh, trying to understand insect flight uh, and you know, uh, teaches us about uh, shared principles and uh, methods among living organisms. And in particular, one starts from, in our particular perspective, we start from building models of physics of flight. And that gradually leads us to a connection to, in fact, the uh, fundamental neural control of their behavior. And uh, we're currently working on uh, evolution of flight. So I think uh, that's a good place for me to pause. And uh, so, uh, so I did. And so thanks to this, I managed to collect some uh, uh, group uh, uh, pictures, and uh, uh, of, of graduate students and uh, uh, postdocs. And I might miss some, but uh, it was an. Uh, 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 extremely uh, sort of engaging to work with all of them. Um, in terms of the final sort of uh, tips as uh, everybody was uh, sharing, and I think for me, I think it's very important uh, to build a healthy science culture. In other words, even though I was being talking about my particular trajectory, but I think without a, a sort of a general 
atmosphere of doing good science and that good science and the collegiality is being valued, uh, one would suffer. So it's everybody's responsibility, uh, whether we are professors, postdocs, and students, uh, we should actually have our own good principles, meaning that even though there are lots of turbulence around us, we might uh, we might uh, we should often remind ourselves it's very good it's very important to follow our own good instincts, uh, find good people, do good work, and recognize the good work of others as well and help others. And so as a result, and the, I think science will be more fun, life will be more fun and uh, more discoveries uh, will, uh, we, people will have their genuine discoveries. And I think for postdocs, in, uh, students and postdocs, and one of the um, fundamental uh, struggle is what to work on. And, uh, and so I think I went through that, many of us went through that. It is really about in search of inspiring research directions. And, that, uh, um, and I think it's important to ask new questions. And for me in particular, it has always been, uh, it's a pleasure to reason from the beginning because there you actually have an enormous uh, possibilities and you actually know why you are asking the question that everything follows from that will start to make sense. You kind of really build, the, build your models from the uh, very beginning and always remind uh, ourselves why we study such a system. Um, and I think this idea, this these uh, this kind of instinct for always doing something new and to be explorative, uh, does have a genetic background. Here are my parents; uh, they were visiting uh, me here, and uh, we went to Corning Museum, and they were trying out. And this is their first attempt of drawing some insects uh, in the museum. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you, thank you, Jane. Um... I think we are a little bit off with the time. Shri, what do you think? Um, we are a little bit over. If you have a yeah. burning question, Irene, go for it. Otherwise, we'll turn it over to the next speaker after thanking Jane. Okay. I think. I mean, I think the only comment I wanted to make, yeah. Jane made, made it herself in the end, and uh, name uh, that we we also have discussed this: the importance for young people just to be exposed to interesting questions and problems. So I will not I will not take time on this and leave leave uh, leave time for the next <laughs> speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I'm closing the recording, and thank you, Irene, as well.